In this video, I'm going to take a look at production trends of oil, gold, and silver. There has been much discussion in the community about peak gold and peak silver, and so I thought I'd put the subject to the test with some real data. I've chosen to use the methodology of Mary and Hubbard because it has proven to be remarkably accurate for oil and many other finite resources. If you haven't heard of Mary and Hubbard, he was a geologist who worked for Shell Oil in the mid-20th century. He predicted the peaking of U.S. oil production in the early 1970s, and at the time of his prediction, which was in the 50s and 60s, few believed him. But after his prediction came true, he was invited to give testimony before Congress. Let's take a look at world oil production data and use it as an example so that I can show you how his method of analysis works. Here is a picture of historical world oil production as a function of time. Now what Dr. Hubbard knew was that oil was a finite resource. There's only so much of it in existence, and once it's gone, it's gone. As with all resources, after their discovery, you have a period of time where technology is developed for exploitation of the resource, where equipment is put in place to extract the resource, and where effort is spent scouring the globe for additional deposits of the resource. So the growth at first is slow, but it exponentially increases. Because technology only develops over time, the easiest to extract resources are harvested first, and gradually, over time, the remaining resources become more difficult to extract. Eventually, a point is reached where the difficulty of extracting additional resources overwhelms the benefits of technological advancement. It's at this point where exponential growth in production slows and then eventually goes into decline. So technology is of great benefit, but no matter how technologically advanced the extraction methods are, it is impossible to extract more resources than were there in the first place. So Hubbard knew that the production of finite resources followed what's called a logistic differential equation. I won't go into details here because it's not necessary, and it might put a lot of you to sleep. I'll just leave it to you to trust me on the math, which I'll do for you. To determine the parameters of the logistic differential equation, all one has to do is plot on the x-axis cumulative production, and on the y-axis the production each year as a fraction of cumulative production. If the logistical differential equation is the right equation to use to describe the resource production curve, then the result should be a straight line. Let's see what this does for the oil data shown here. Well, this did linearize the data quite a bit. There's a bit of wiggle in the data from the 1970s. This is the time when U.S. oil production started to decline and production from the Middle East ramped up to more than compensate for it. This shouldn't matter too much. Notice that about two-thirds of cumulative world oil production took place afterwards, in the past three decades. And for this section of data, we see a nice, well-defined line. So we'll focus on that section. But before I go on, I'd like to point out just how amazing it is when you think about it that two-thirds of the oil that has been produced throughout history has been consumed in the past 30 years. You should take some time later and think about the implications of that fact. Okay, let's go on. Let's draw a line through the linear portion of this data. When we do so, we see that most of the data points for production over the past three decades are pretty close to this line. The significance of the slope of the line is that it signifies how much more difficult the resource is to extract as time progresses. Notice that the line intercepts the x-axis at the value of about 3,000 billion barrels of total oil production or about three trillion. The significance of this number is that it is the total area under the production curve. It represents what Marion Hubbard called the ultimate recoverable resource. It's an estimate of the maximum amount of the resource, in this case oil, that can be extracted from the earth. How does this data compare to what we think we know about oil now? Well, we know that total world oil production to date has been 1,322 billion barrels. The EIA estimates that world oil reserves currently stand at 1,646 billion barrels. Add these two numbers, and the result should be how much oil that was available to be extracted before we started pulling it out of the ground. This results in an estimate of 2,968 billion barrels, which is pretty close to the 3,000 billion barrel estimate that was determined by the analysis of a simple graph. Pretty neat, huh? But what's the practical significance of this for you? Well, 
Let's take the logistic differential equation and put it back in a form that's more readily interpreted, the production versus time curve. So here's what the model looks like in the past and 20 years out into the future. Why only 20 years? Well, I'm not a big fan of extrapolation far into the future. I believe that trends can be counted on for about a decade or two. But beyond that, there's just too much that can happen. Notice that the curve does a pretty nice job of fitting the past production data. It qualitatively explains the data fairly well, even the data from the early half of the 20th century, which was not used in the development of the model. What's alarming about the curve is that it peaks in about the year 2020. In other words, growth in oil production is not expected beyond the next five years or so. Afterwards, we'll enter into an era of gradual decline. This will create quite a shock for an economic system which relies on growth for its existence. Growth will just not be possible after about the year 2020, simply because we won't have the fossil fuel availability to support further growth. It's pretty easy to understand why this is so. We've har harvested 1,322 billion barrels in the past. The EIA thinks we have about 1,646 billion barrels left. And quite a bit of this 1,646 billion barrels is deep water and tight oil, which is very difficult to extract. So almost half of the total oil initially present has been used, and the rest of it is more difficult to harvest. And so it's not difficult to accept that oil production will be peaking soon. And what about the miracle of fracking? Well, the increased production data from fracking over the past few years was included in this analysis of mine. So it's all baked into the cake, folks. So now that we've used this analysis for oil, can we use it for other resources that are of interest to us? Sure. Let's start with gold. I'm going to skip the initial presentation of the production curve and go straight to the Hubbard linearization to save some time. There's quite a bit more wiggle in the data, but we can see that it does look somewhat linear. So let's just fit a line and then translate it back to the production versus time curve and see how well it represents the production data. If it represents it well, then we'll trust it. First though, notice that the production as a fraction of total production has been gradually decreasing over time. Again, this is a classic trend of a difficult to produce resource. The easy to obtain gold was harvested first, and then over time it has become more and more difficult to produce, regardless of technological advancement. About a century ago, the above ground stock of gold grew at a rate of 2% per year, and the rate at which new gold could be produced relative to the above ground stock has been on a gradual decline. It currently stands at about 1.7% per year. Keep that low production rate versus above ground stock number in, the, in your head for later. And so with that said, let's go to the production versus time chart. We can see from this chart that the model actually describes the data fairly well. Yes, there have been fits and starts in gold production over the past century, but for the most part, the general shape of the production curve is described well. So we can probably be comfortable extrapolating into the future by a couple of decades. Notice that there is no sign that gold production is going to peak anytime soon. But that really doesn't matter. All it means is that the main quality that makes gold an attractive store of value, namely its high stock to flow ratio, will persist into the future. I've covered the importance of a high stock to flow ratio in many other videos. Please go watch them if you want more details. But in brief, the importance of the high stock to flow is that it's evidence that the world hoards the item as a store of value and that there will be no large supply shocks to disrupt the value of the above ground stock. If the model is accurate, then we can predict that in 20 years, yearly production will be about 27% higher than it is now. The total above ground stock will be about 43% higher than it is now, but the ratio of the production to the above ground stock will actually diminish. It will go from 1.7% per year down to about 1.5% per year. This should make gold an even more reliable store of value. And so it's a good thing, even though gold production is probably not going to peak over the next couple of decades. Now let's take a look at silver and see what the analysis says to us. Again, we'll start off by fast forwarding past the preliminaries. Here's actual world silver production data for the past century plotted as a Hubbard linearization. There are two things that immediately leap from the page. 
The first is that, is that the data is quite linear over the time period that represents more than half of the total historical production. And that fact should make this quite useful. The second thing to notice is that the line seems to be going in the wrong direction. It's positive and not negative in slope. And what's the consequence of this? Well, it means that the growth rate of silver production is not only exponential, but it's super exponential. The exponential rate of growth is actually increasing in magnitude and not decreasing. Suffice it to say that this cannot possibly persist forever, but if it persists for even the near term, then silver production can be expected to stay strong in the near future. Let's see what the plot of production as a function of time looks like. The model fit to the data describes its shape very well, and so the logistic differential equation holds. It shows the super exponential growth rate of silver production. If we extrapolate 20 years into the future, we can draw a few conclusions. First, the production rate of silver, if its current trajectory holds, will be 113% higher 20 years from now than it is today. Assuming that half of the production is used in industry and half of it is stored for wealth preservation, then 20 years from now we can expect the above ground stock to be about 80% higher than it is today. Ultimately, what it means is that the growth rate in the above ground stock will go from its current value of 2.7% per year to 3.2% per year. Again, I'm assuming a 50% consumption rate for industrial use, and so half of the newly mined silver won't be used to increase the above ground stock. So what does this all mean? Well, first off, it means that there is no sign of a production peak in gold or silver, and silver's production rate has been increasing at a super exponential rate for decades. Will silver's production trend change? Of course, it has to. Unless, of course, you believe that silver can be spontaneously produced in the Earth's crust in short periods of time. And I don't believe that. And so eventually, we will hit a limit, but it won't necessarily be over the next 20 years. Does it mean that silver will become cheaper over time? No. Remember, silver is used in industry just like oil, and so over time, silver must become harder to extract from the Earth's crust, just as oil becomes harder to extract. As that happens, the only way to increase the supply is to increase the incentive to those who mine it. In other words, production may increase, but price will also have to increase as well. Just as higher prices in oil were required to incent companies to pursue the production of tight oil via fracking. The other thing to bear in mind is that most of the data from the past was used to that was used to construct these curves was in an era of plentiful energy. Thus, energy was not necessarily acting as a constraint on metals production. Gold and silver are very energy intensive to produce. If oil does peak over the next five years, it is bound to have some type of impact on gold and silver. It may or may not have an impact on production rate, but it will certainly have an impact on price. And that impact will be to drive price higher. So let's discuss these trends. I'm interested in your thoughts. Please leave comments.